uh, on April 4th of 2002, my personal trainer came into my house, drugged me, wrapped my face and head in saran wrap and beat me black and blue. He was charged with deliberate premeditated attempted murder, burglary in the first degree, assault with a deadly weapon and criminal threats. And, and what I experienced, I would never want anybody else to have to experience to feel as if their voice wasn't heard, their victimization didn't matter, um, and that the offender meant more to a system or to a community than actually the victim or the crime survivor. And that's why I'm here to make a difference for victims of crime. Myself personally, as a survivor, I have not been called on when these laws are going into effect like AB 109 or Prop 47 or Prop 57 um, to be able to have all these individuals out there supporting the offenders, the criminals, the one that commit the crimes, yet they're not calling individuals uh, that have been victimized, that are surviving, that are challenged to be able to get the resources to thrive and to really be able to get justice. And therefore, we feel that our legislators should really include the victims and the crime survivors at the table when they're considering these laws, because it affects the, the victims as much or more so than it actually affects the offenders. And it also affects our legislators, our community, our children, our family members. And we wanna make sure that we're keeping our community safe. The attempted murderer that tried to kill me and threatened to kill my son um, served approximately 120 days five years anger management and five years probation. And uh, since he has been on the street, I did have an interaction with uh, probation for some time after um, in regards to restitution, in regards to Marcy's law, which didn't pass until after the fact in 2008. However, um, I have to say that probation was very interactive. Um, they answered my calls, they listened and they heard me. Um, and so I think probation should always have an intricate role, um, not only working with the offender, but that they're there to also work with the victims and the crime survivors and the family members so that we're balancing the scales of justice, because I do believe it takes working with both sides in order to make it work. Sure, we can always improve on things, absolutely, but we cannot change things drastically because there are going to be more victims and innocent victims being victimized if we start changing things without knowing what works and does not work. As a test pilot or a program, you know, it's not gonna work. We need to keep probation there and especially to support the victims and the crime survivors as a survivor myself, as survivors and victims that I deal with every single day um, that have been victimized by juveniles. It's very alarming and concerning when we have elected officials coming forward and saying they wanna close camps, they wanna shut these things down, they don't wanna have probation involved or overseeing these juveniles, they're just kids, they're just children, they just made a mistake. Well, unfortunately, they victimized somebody violently, viciously, dangerously, um, they've jeopardized public safety, they've jeopardized our children, our communities, um, and we need to hold them accountable. If we don't have consequences, then what happens? They're going to go on and re-victimize the victim that they already victimized. They're going to re-victimize a new innocent victim in the community that had nothing to do with it, that was just innocent, maybe walking down the street. So it, whether it's a juvenile or an adult, if you commit a crime, if you're in a gang and you violently attack someone, you should be held accountable. You have to be held um, to the, a standard, right? Because otherwise you're gonna go back and do something else again. So I say we need to keep the camps, we need to hold people accountable, um, and we need to make sure that probation is there, working with the system, working with our elected officials, to be able to make sure that we ensure our communities and our it is public safety is a priority. If you decide to let these juveniles and these youth out and a 14 year old that had violently murdered someone or a 16 year old that had raped an elderly woman and you believe that they should be released and they get released and a month later they go on and they break into your mom and dad's home um, and the 14 year old violently uh, rapes your mom and murders your father, um, or the 16 year old goes on and while your kid is walking to school, violently goes and attacks your child, um, rapes, sexually assaults and murders your child and leaves them for dead on the way to their school. How do you feel then?
And I would never want this to ever happen to any elected official or anyone. I would never want anyone to feel what myself has felt or what any of the victims that I deal with day in and day out. But I would really like for them to be able to ponder on that for a moment because I truly believe that they would reconsider and not want these juveniles to get out and to serve their time. And it, it just, I wish they would listen to us. I wish they would hear some of our heart, some of our passion, and some of the reason on why we are being a voice for the voiceless and why we wanna partner with our DAs, with uh, probation, with judges, with community leaders to be able to say, we need to hold these offenders accountable, whether they're juveniles or whether they're adults. But we must not forget the victims and the crime survivors when we're out there trying to you know, make stronger laws, that we're trying to make a better system. It, it's a struggle.